it is indescribable what God has done. Uh, maybe it is describable because of the technology that we have. But when you consider that whatever you say today, if it's untaped, if it's videoed, it now is memorialized. And today, I thought it was a sort of epic kind of a day where the Holy Spirit moved in a mighty way. Every power that was against me coming home from Jamaica was in play. And yet still with the storms and with the delays and me coming in at 1.30 or getting in uh, at 1 last night, getting home and into bed at 1.32 to uh, after 2 o'clock. It was just an incredible trip. However, God gave a wonderful word, and we didn't memorialize it. For some reason, we had the horrible glitches, because actually, we're not in our home church. We're not in what we have put together uh, technologically and mechanically as a church. So uh, something went wrong, and we didn't do it. I talked about 23 seconds, and actually, the scripture was in the book of John, John chapter 19. Uh, verse 31 through verse 37, but the emphasis, of course, was on verse 35. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true. What did he see and bear record of? Verse 34, that's the main one, not 35. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. So I literally preached about the blood, and my subject was 23 seconds. And because we didn't memorialize it, I can't play it tonight. I went with atonement, umbrellaing reconciliation, umbrellaing justification, umbrellaing redemption, umbrellaing propitiation. I dealt with all the legal issues surrounding the blood. Then I dealt with the vitality of the blood. Life of the flesh is in the blood. Then I compared it to our blood. And in 23 seconds, the heart beats five quarts of blood around through our bodies. And it's the five quarts of blood that Jesus had in his body that has the power to save everybody who has ever lived, had the power to save them, has the power to save everyone who is living now, and the power to save everyone who will be born. I did the piece in Jamaica, but this was rendered for the home church, and we didn't memorialize it. So, we're going to play something today, and I think I'm going to take some time out and just go through this so that you can have it not in that hyped-up, spirit-moving, fast-paced preaching, but maybe we'll just sit and talk about how powerful the blood of Jesus is and how significant it is for us to go back to the fundamentals and do those things that are rudimentally pure for the Christian experience. God bless you. Enjoy what God is giving you today. And remember, give us the support so that we can get this thing fine, refined and done on an excellent way, so we have no more glitches. God bless you. Enjoy. We're going into the sanctuary now. 14, and also in chapter 16, and we find the closing words of Jesus as he is preparing his disciples for his exit. And it's very critical now that they receive his words because they're going to be entrusted with the deed of perpetuating what he has started. It's an interesting thing that the Lord has always recruited others to carry on his work. And they have to be convinced, they have to be totally and completely convinced that he is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God. And so his words, as he begins to sum up, become very powerful and, and very significant for their strength. So in chapter 14, the Let Not Your Heart Be Troubled chapter, in the verse 15, he says, If you love me,
keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Now that's interesting, not for your lifetime, but he will abide with you forever. Ah. Now that's hitting me a little harder than I've never considered that. That the Holy Spirit is not only here to guide us through our lifetime, but he will be with us forever. So the relationship that begins in time will continue into eternity. And I'm convinced now that any relationship that's going to last forever had better be a good one. Yeah, all of a sudden that, that, that thing is hitting me real, that, that's, that's real, that's real interesting here. Abide with you forever. Which means I have to love God because he's going to be with me forever. And if you don't love God, you don't have to worry about it. Because God's not going to be with anybody forever who doesn't love him. I tell you, that's why people go to hell. Amen. God does people a favor when he lets them go to hell. Amen. Hmm. You don't want to be with somebody forever you don't love. <laughs> oh, okay. I only took an aspirin. I didn't take anything but an aspirin a while ago. I, uh, uh, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not. Neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, that's the incarnate, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye shall see me, because I live. Ye shall live also at that day. Ye shall know that I am in my Father, ye in me, and I in you. I preached that the other day, but it was totally different, wasn't it? Uh, in chapter 16, verse 5, he says, But now I go my way to him that sent me, and none of you ask me, Whither goest thou? But because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he is come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin because they believe not on me. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and ye see me no more. Of judgment because the prince of this world is judge. I want you to look at somebody and tell them, I'm comforted by my anointing. Look at somebody else and tell them, my anointing comforts me. Amen. Again, John is, is, is very, very important because he has been strategically placed to bring about a revelatory experience by God for each one of us who reads his writings. I marvel at the significance of John because God has placed him close enough to him to manifest and reveal himself to John 
so that John can in turn reveal him to us. He is very careful in how he presents Jesus and if you follow this, his writings carefully, you will find that he presents him in such a manner that all of us are given the opportunity to believe on him because believing on him becomes the substratum by which we will have a relationship with God. So early in the book, what he does is he marries Christology to theology and he does it quite simply by declaring to us that there is a relationship between the logos and God. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. The logos is defined in many theological circles as the thought of God. Because before there is a declaration of a word, there has to be a thought. But if you have a thought, you've got to have a thinker. And what he does now is he brings the relationship of Christology and theology together. He says, in order for you to get to God, you have to know Jesus. Because you cannot get to the Father except through the Son. And Jesus declared, no man comes except the father draw but he has to be drawn through the son jesus christ it's very significant because he expresses the relationship of jesus christ in relationship to god and us because there has to be a link between the holy father and the sinner and the link between the two become the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And so he establishes beyond a doubt that if you're going to have any kind of relationship with God, you have to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's quite important because I have found that if you worship Jesus, you're worshiping God. And if you worship God, you worship Jesus. And we don't make a distinction between praising God or praising Jesus. Because all of us seem to accept the fact that Jesus is God. And there is a relationship between Christology and theology. One stands for the other and the other stands for the one. Because without Jesus, you can never know God. He comes to his own, the scripture says, John makes it clear, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. You see, John is very careful now to present Jesus in a manner that all of us have the opportunity to receive him. Because by receiving Jesus, he in turn gives you power to become a son of God. He is saying you have to join the fellowship. You have to come and be a part of who I am. And if you commingle with me, I'll give you the power to become a son of God. Uh, I wonder how many folk in here have enough power to make somebody like them. How many folk in here have the power to influence the person who joins you to become like you and have the power and the privilege that you have? What Jesus is saying is, if you receive me, I'll give you the power to have my privileges. And the same way that I relate to God, I'll give you the power to relate to God because you have received me. Do you know that God oftentimes blesses people who receive who he has blessed? And many times when you're blessed, if people will receive you, then the blessing that God has bestowed upon you will also be extended to them. Ah, I heard him say one place that I'll bless who blesses you and I'll curse who curses you.
because anytime you have a relationship with me the significant thing is if folk don't like you they don't like me <laughs> and if you don't believe me ask Mordecai and Haman Mordecai was never going to submit himself to Haman because Haman didn't love God and if you don't love God then he is saying I'm not going to be close to you because I just want to be close to people who are close to God <laughs> It is important because Jesus Christ becomes God's thought for us. And what he becomes is, he becomes the material instead of the mystical. Because the incarnate God, particularly when you read the part, and the word became flesh. Once the word becomes flesh, now we can view and see the operation of God among men. So as many as received the thought, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And now it becomes important because John goes further, he says, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. He now takes us into a deeper walk because what he's saying essentially now is that anybody who receives Jesus did not receive him out of their own intellect, but they received him because they were born born of the will of God. That means that Jesus then becomes that pivotal point that decides whether or not God has chosen you to be a part of the family. Because everybody in here that saved was literally chosen in him before the foundation of the world. But somehow it had to be transferred to us. The fact that God has had his hand on us before we got here. And the way he does it is he puts Jesus up. And everybody who receives Jesus is now one who he has chosen. You can't receive Jesus if you haven't been chosen. Oh, I feel like preaching now. Uh, that alone gives me comfort because what it says to me is that my choosing of Jesus was not my starting point with God. God chose me to choose Jesus. So nobody comes except the Father draw, but he is the door by which you entered. He is the way, he is the truth. So when he presents Jesus, for everybody who chooses Jesus, they become sons of God. For everyone who chooses Jesus, Jesus knows who he should be with. Oh, let me put it another way. I think let me a little too verbose. Uh, Jesus says, Whom do men say that I am? And Peter's response was, Some say, No, uh, the general response was, Some say, Thou art Elias, Jeremiah, and one of the prophets. Now, Peter's response is, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said, to him flesh and blood did not reveal that to you but my father which is in heaven which means your intellect didn't do this the university of jerusalem didn't do this your smartness didn't do this when you opened your mouth what came out of your mouth came from the father so now jesus becomes that as to whether or not you are chosen by God and then he turns around and says now since you know who I am I will give you the keys to the kingdom oh I feel like preaching this anytime you know who he is it releases him to empower you the only way you are empowered is to know who he is oh, upon this rock I'll build my church 
and the rock of course is not Peter the rock is Jesus but you've got to know who he is for him to release the keys if you want keys to victory if you want keys to power if you want keys to anointing if you want keys to salvation you have to know who I am I'm not giving the keys to folk who don't know me I'm not releasing power to people who aren't with me I'm not going to take folk to the next level who don't love me because you have to know who I am you have to know who I am when the trials of life arise you have to know who I am when your enemies show up you have to know who I am when your sickness comes you gotta know who I am when death is facing you the key to your walk with God is knowing who Jesus is and so consequently what you've got now is revelation in relationship and you've got relationship in revelation and here is where purpose and destiny come together because if we're going to be with you forever then you have to reveal to me my purpose see part of the misery of life is not knowing why you are here and oftentimes when there's a conundrum when an individual does not have purpose or direction in their lives and the only way to know why you're here is for God to tell you <laughs> But I didn't bring you here just to get married. I didn't bring you into this world just to have a house or a car. I didn't bring you here just to wear Louboutin, Givenchy, or Charles Jardin. I brought you in here for a purpose. And that purpose is to bless who I want to bless, touch who I want to touch, move to who I want to move to and have a meaning for your life oh, I feel it here how, how many clothes do you have to have to be happy how many shoes do you have to have to be happy you got more shoes more clothes more houses more cars and you're still not fulfilled because fulfillment does not come from acquiring things it comes from giving yourself uh, I feel a breakthrough here uh, don't be sorry for me uh, you know I'll suffer after this uh, it's important now because this relationship and destiny and purpose has to come together and once somebody understands why God has his hand on me and why he brought me into the world it gives you a certain comfort and a certain confidence because if he brought me in here for a purpose there is no devil in hell that can stop me from fulfilling my purpose and my destiny and God will never move you out of here until you have accomplished what he set you here to accomplish uh, you might as well just enjoy the ride because there is nothing that can stop you from being who God made you. And that's why when you know your purpose and your destiny, you don't try to be like anybody else. Because in trying to be like everybody else, I abort my reason for being here. And my reason for being here is as good as anybody else's because God has a hand on me. Oh, I feel it now he has to move us then from Christology into pneumatology because what he does now is he connects us to theology and then he stands between theology and pneumatology and the reason for that is he is Jesus the Christ and if he is the Christos then he is the anointed one now there might be many Jesus in the world but every Jesu is not the anointed one there is something very special about the anointed one because he is on the assignment to release the 
anointing into the world. He is different than the prophets because in the prophets what would happen is the spirit would come when God had a particular thing for them to do and then he would withdraw his spirit when the thing was accomplished. He would get in them in order to do it but then he would withdraw his spirit after it was done. But the anointed one was different from the prophets. I found a quote that is a little obscure and it goes like this. It's from the Odes of Solomon. And what it does is it exhibits the, and stresses the dove tradition because John had to know who Jesus was. When he was baptizing, he was told that someone is coming who is my son and John didn't know who he was so he was told when you see the dove descend that's the one in other words when the Holy Ghost comes upon him in the form of a dove you will know who the Christos is you see you're going to baptize many people looking for the one person and when you see the one person you will understand he is special that's why later John told them I must decrease and he must increase because he is the sent one with the power of God I was finding this quote and it said very carefully and I and I quote when it came to pass when the Lord was come up out of the water the whole font of the Holy Spirit descended upon him and said to him my son in all the prophets was I waiting for thee that thou shouldest come and I might rest in thee for thou art my rest thou art my first begotten son that reigneth forever unquote he did not rest on the prophets but he waited to the time of the prophets for to rest on Jesus there is no prophet that can do for you what Jesus has already done. There is no man who has given the assignment to spread the anointing into somebody else. If you are anointed, your anointing has to come directly from Jesus Christ. Oh, I feel like preaching now. So Jesus then becomes the manifestation of God and in his Christology there is theology but he also becomes the resting place of the Holy Spirit which means in his Christology there is pneumatology so Jesus then becomes the place where theology and pneumatology meet for out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water well how did the living waters get in there God put them in there and the Holy Ghost takes it out and it's all in Jesus oh, that's why John uses the baptism to establish and stress the anointing and the indwelling of the spirit with Jesus and he's influenced by Isaiah because Isaiah says it this way there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him the spirit of wisdom and understanding the spirit of counsel and might the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord whenever the spirit of God comes it brings wisdom and whenever he comes he brings understanding whenever he comes he brings might and counsel and wherever he comes he brings knowledge and whenever he comes he brings the fear of the Lord can I preach like I feel it you know a praiser can betray Jesus and Judas was a praiser by his name a praiser can betray Judas because everything that hath breath ought to praise the Lord you praise him for what he does but only a worshiper 
God can avoid betraying. A praiser can betray, but a worshiper can't betray. Because to worship him, you have to worship him in spirit and in truth. My worship is not just coming from my lips. My worship must come from my spirit. And it's based on what I know about God. Oh, I feel like preaching in here. That's why this is a forever relationship. It's not for a temporary move. Can I preach like I feel it? You see, you can have a temporary relationship with somebody that's just physical. You can have a temporary relationship with somebody that's purely intellectual. You can have my money and we can share money. But if we're going to last for any length of time, we're going to have to have the same spirit uh, see the problem is we deal with people on a physical level and we wonder why it's up and down and pretty much broke up real quick because it doesn't matter how they look it doesn't matter what they have it doesn't matter the circumstances of their life what's going to keep you together is having the same spirit oh, I feel a breakthrough in here I feel a breakthrough Mm. Uh, I told him I'm never going to say I don't have a church I wish I had a church because I feel something in this church right now somebody's praying for me uh, just pray I get through this that's all you've got to understand the same spirit which means that you need to probe into the spirit of an individual because if we have the same spirit then we can overcome everything that comes our way because in order to be one with somebody you have to have the same spirit why do we have to have the same spirit because the spirit is what controls the attitude is what controls the disposition is what controls what comes out of your mouth is what controls your behavior and when you have the same spirit you can walk together how can two walk together except they agree oh, I feel a breakthrough here give somebody a high five and say you better find someone with the same spirit oh magnify the Lord with me we can't magnify the Lord together if we don't have the same spirit oh God and so now the messianic temptations experience in the power of the spirit because if you notice now Matthew tells us that it was the spirit that led him into the wilderness which means part of the assignment of the spirit was to lead him in to the wilderness it doesn't say it led him into temptation it simply said he led him into the wilderness you see God knows the place to put you in order for what's in you to come out and it is the challenges of life that bring out the power that's in you this is why he says that when he entered into the wilderness and this is Luke 4 and verse 1 he entered into the wilderness he was full of the spirit but when he returned he returned in the power of the spirit you see you have got to move from just being full of the spirit to the power of the spirit I didn't fill you with the spirit not to give you power but I've got to put you through something in order for your power to be released oh, that's why Satan asked him if thou be the son of God well if you don't know who I am I'm not going to tell you who I am I'm just going to use the word of God against you if thou be 
the son of God. <laughs> to know that I'm the son of God, you either have to be a demon or somebody saved. <laughs> oh, I'll get to that later. I'll get to that later. <laughs> he refuses, but the point is made that the messiahship <laughs> and supernatural power are united in him. <laughs> I am Jesus, the Christos. <laughs> I am associated with with power and when I release power I'm going to release it to everyone who has received me because if you receive me you receive my name and if you receive me you receive my anointing because I have to anoint you to become a son of God and that's why he tells you and I we shall do greater works because he has released us to tear the devil's kingdom down. Oh, I feel a break. Yeah, I'm almost there. It is an interesting thing that, as I said a minute ago, that demons are the first to be aware of his complete identity and in no less place than the synagogue. Mark 1 24 tells me that the demon cried out saying, let us alone, what have we to do with thee? Thou Jesus of Nazareth, art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of of God. It's an interesting thing that a demonized man recognizes who Jesus is because he's not looking at Jesus. He's looking at the Christus or the anointed one. He realizes that there is a spirit in Jesus that is totally opposed to his spirit. That's why I tell the children of God when you go into a place that sometimes people react to you adversely but it's not mind against mind. It's not intellect against intellect. It's spirit against spirit because when you walk in a room every spirit that's not your spirit will know that something in you has just bombarded the atmosphere because you can't walk in a room and not change the spiritual atmosphere oh I might not have more money than you I certainly might not look better than you but there is a spirit that comes when you're anointed that'll shake up the house oh Jesus of Nazareth what do we have to do with you? Have you come to torment us before our time? I feel a breakthrough coming. You know, oftentimes you torment people because of your spirit. Oh, they just get all crazy. Who do you think you are? What do you think you can do about it? It ain't got nothing with how you look. It's just your your spirit my spirit transcends my spirit brings power my spirit brings grace my spirit brings affection my spirit brings the love of God and if you're not with my spirit then you better back up because the spirit of God takes control of the place of God and that's how he intends oh give somebody a high five and say don't feel bad just keep being you that's all keep keep being you uh -huh. just keep loving people keep serving keep being anointed because the anointing destroys the yoke and when you walk up the devil knows he got to get his hand off somebody because there is an anointing in the house that breaks the yoke that Satan has on your neighbor oh your anointing is not for yourself but it's for everybody who comes in your space and if folk don't like you that 
it's all right just keep moving in the power of the spirit of god uh, and so the man the man uh, gary bird says it like this and i quote he says it is striking that Jesus' authority over spirits is first uncovered in the synagogue because everybody in the house of God is not in the spirit of God. Uh huh, uh huh, uh huh, uh huh. Uh, give somebody a high five and tell them the devil goes to church. The devil, yes, the devil. He wants to pollute the house of God. He wants to tear down the house of God. He wants to break up the house of God. He wants to introduce all kinds of abstractions in the house of God. He wants to cause division in the house of God. Ah, oh, but there is a spirit that will not allow him to work. Not in God's house. You can work in your house, but not in God's house. Get out of here. That's why Jesus declares that the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he hath anointed me to bind up the brokenhearted. I'm here to tell you when you're anointed, God uses you. Yes, he does. To bind up the brokenhearted. What he does is he fix what Satan has already done. And he does it from deep down in the spirit. That's why when you come to God, your past is about to be erased by the power of the Holy Ghost. Just bring him the broken heart. Uh, let him proclaim liberty to the captive. That's why I'm anointed. I'm anointed to proclaim liberty to the captive. I'm anointed to opening the prison and releasing folks and proclaiming the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he closed the book. I feel like preaching. He has a way of closing the book. I'm in charge. This is my power. This is my place. And I've been anointed and let the devil rise. Can I tell you this? Every time God moves you to a higher place of anointing, here comes the devil from every side. Uh, but don't worry. There is no weapon formed against you shall prosper there is nothing the devil can do shake somebody's hand like you go shake it off and say the devil might oppress you the devil might attack you but he can't destroy you ask job anybody gotta ask for permission is not in charge I feel like preaching. His power was not only to be seen in the extraordinary healings and exorcism, but chiefly eschatological reign. His had to be visible and present. It was not only to see him in action, but it was also in his word. You all might as well rest a little bit. I just got a little more to go. He was a prophet in that he bore the spirit which revealed the will of God with unprecedented authority because you can't walk in anointing and not walk in authority because once you have control over demonic possessions you have control over the whole place can I preach like I feel that that's why the Lord tells you and I if you resist the devil he will flee from you but you don't resist him physically you resist him spiritually and what he's talking about is when you and I join together not just our hands but our spirit because when two or three agree then I am in the midst of 
love them because if you and I can join our spirits then there is no devil in hell that can stop us from marching forward and every time you take your territory you don't give the enemy back I'm just like I'm just like Patton when he said I will not fight for one piece of real estate twice once you got the devil under your feet keep him under your feet don't let him up and then you got to wrestle with him again if I ever get him under my feet I'm gonna keep him under my feet I'm not gonna let up and back off get out of my house get out of my car get out of my child get out get out get out i'm gonna press the victory i'm gonna have victory give somebody a high five for the third to the last time and say i'm gonna have victory for the dawn declares whom god had sent speak at the words of god for god giveth him the spirit without measure so the activity of revealing is anointing the power of the word is anointing and the word and the spirit are interdependent that's why jesus said the words that i speak unto you they are spirit and they are life don't look at my physicality when i say if you eat my flesh and drink my blood you'll have life in you and the disciples backed up and said well we're not cannibals and he said will ye also go and they said to whom shall we go because you have the words of life and Jesus declared the flesh profiteth nothing it's the words I speak I feel the Holy Ghost you don't have to say verily verily and you don't need a title all you gotta do is open your mouth in the anointed position and watch God bless whoever is around you you can bless somebody on the bus by simply opening your mouth and let God direct your words you can bless somebody in the grocery store because when you're anointed it does not leave it rests on you I heard somebody say when the preacher starts preaching and when they say here come the anointing especially when you move into a sort of singing kind of preaching somebody says here comes the anointing I've got news for you when he was bowling he was anointed when he was driving up to the church he was anointed because anointing doesn't come and go like it used to it rests oh i feel it in here it rests on you and the problem here was that the disciples were object failures abject because the spirit was upon Jesus while it was not yet upon his disciples because it had to be released outside of Jesus Jesus God put it in him but the cross has to release it because Jesus said the Holy Ghost was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified and the word there is doxathemi that means John collapsed the historical events of the cross death resurrection ascension and anointing into a single movement of Jesus's life and he puts him up on the cross that's why he says if I if I'm being lifted up I will draw all men unto me I've got to go up on the cross and be elevated like the serpent in the wilderness when you look at me and 
receive my death, burial, and resurrection. I will release my anointing because the cross is hanging up to heaven, but it's reaching out to everybody. Not only is it connecting the earth to heaven, it's connecting the world to him. If I be lifting up, I'll draw all men unto me. It's a double meaning here because he lifts me heavenward and that's why he told Nicodemus the new birth is the consequence of believing the son of God this follows ascension this follows resurrection and this follows Calvary and now he can say to us the paraclete is not merely a post ascension figure the paraclete is involved in the dynamics of ascension itself I must be glorified before the paraclete is released but don't you worry when you see me hanging on the cross don't you worry when I go down into the grave don't you worry when I come up on resurrection morning and don't you worry when I ascend into the heavens I just need you to go to Jerusalem and just stay there till you receive power power from on high because I will not leave you comfortless I will come to you give somebody a high five he said he's already come he's already back how do I know I got him in my spirit the only reason I'm still here is because he is in me I feel the Holy Spirit I got something I got to give you give somebody high five for the second to the last time and said the only reason I'm still here is I got power of the anointing the only reason I can overcome is the power of the anointing and God anointed you to bless somebody else God anointed you to infect somebody else and that's why the enemy is on your case because he doesn't want you to walk in your anointing because he's scared that you might infect the people around you he's scared that you might snatch somebody out of his kingdom but I came to bring life I feel the Holy Spirit in here I feel the power of God and sometimes you gotta hang on a cross until power is released from you then folks around you will know that you are a child of God it doesn't come from rubbing on somebody or shaking somebody's hand that's anointed you gotta go through until the power of God is released out of your system you gotta go through till you can praise him in the middle of trial you gotta go through till you can worship him when people write you off you gotta be able to take the mocking take the jeering take the hurting they'll walk on you they'll mistreat you they'll talk about you but they can't touch your anointing they can't break your spirit they can't destroy your purpose they can't back you up they can't control your destiny they cannot stop God from using who he chooses give somebody high five for the last time and say my anointing gives me comfort my anointing 
gives me peace my anointing give me joy my anointing gives me fulfillment bring it on devil bring it on bring it on bring it on we've got somebody in the house that's got an anointing to defeat the devil on every side can I preach like I feel it I need some more help give somebody a high five and say there's anointing that brings wealth there is an anointing that heals bodies there is an anointing that opens doors there is an anointing that leads and guides there is an anointing now I ask your neighbor what's your anointing what has God anointed you to do I guarantee he's anointed everybody to bless somebody else then bless them bless them bless them bless them bless your neighbor bless your friends bless bless I'm here to bless bless I feel like preaching walk out and touch seven people and say I'm anointed to bless you in many ways I'm anointed to bless you my singing will bless you my preaching will bless you my giving will bless you my loving will bless you my affection will bless you my helping will bless you my story my story my story tell somebody I got a story that's anointed my past where I've come from how he brought me out how he see me through how he lifted me up how he made a way I'm anointed ah! <laughs> is about to have a big breakthrough you're not gonna break down you gonna break through the anointing will break you
I close. Who's in the house? I close and my word is for everybody in here that God has put a burden on your heart for because the anointing is not for you, but it is for who God has assigned you to. And the interesting thing is that oftentimes your assignment puts you on a cross. Because he places that burden on you and many times you will be misunderstood because people that he assigns you to will oftentimes think that you're in their space looking for something from them but the truth is you've been put on assignment not for something for you but to give something to them. Oh God, I feel it here. And there are times when you get weary, but he says, be not weary and well done. Oh, in due season, you'll reap if you faint not. This assignment is your next level. Oh God, I feel it here to release what God has placed in you to take you to your next level so it seems like he's killing you but I got news for you new life <laughs> is going to rise out of this pain because I'm not coming down from this cross until the job is done. So hang on in there. Don't let go. This is of God. This is not of the enemy. In all the opposition, hang on in there. Because God has put you on assignment. Somebody in this house, God is calling you.